really excited to talk to you all. I hate microphones, by the way. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the fancy slides today. And I thought also just to open it up and have a conversation, because when it comes to data and analytics, a lot of people are kind of curious, but they're also hesitant because there's all this conversation happening about big data. What does it mean? Um, privacy and all those other things from the donor perspective, the alumni perspective, uh, from the organizational perspective. So I'm going to walk through this. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of a conversation as well. If you have questions along the way, just raise your hand. Happy to stop. Uh, or you could save them until later. Totally up to you. Um, so without further ado, um, let's start with this slide. So first of all, who here works on a fundraising team? A few people hesitate. OK. Uh, marketing teams? One person? Half and half? OK. See a couple more hands. What about IT or database, business intelligence, as they're called <laughs> these days? She has all the hats. OK, do you want more name tags? OK, <laughs> very cool. Um, OK, so with all that in mind, can you guys maybe want to throw out a couple of answers in terms of what you think the competitive advantage is without looking at the little rocket? Or what do you guys think the competitive advantage is? Not a trick question. I promise I won't bite if you raise your hand. Yeah, Any? We've got all these relationships with people. Like, there you go. That's a competitive advantage. Okay, that's data. That's a good competitive advantage. Anybody else? Knowing your audience, knowing your people, knowing who they are, what they do, and how to reach them. There you go. That's a great answer. Do you want to do this? Okay. <laughs> Just talking. Anybody else? Sorry? That's definitely a competitive advantage. Hopefully you learn from what doesn't work. Yeah. Some organizations just go into a spiral of doing the exact same thing over and over and over again. I've been at a few of those. Anything else? Understanding their behavior. There you go. That's definitely a competitive advantage by knowing your donors. Yeah. People already like you. If they show in the beta of your database. Okay. They've raised their hand and they said, Me, I want to donate, I want to get involved. That's a great competitive. Yes, because they have to identify themselves. Um, how many the yep, yep. Um, building on that one, actually, how many organizations do you think have the proper systems in place? If we put a percentage, more than 50? Less than 20? $1. One dollar. <laughs> One dollar. <laughs> there you go. Actually, most organizations, big and small, actually don't have a lot of the right systems in place and are still trying to figure it out. Um, and I'll kind of get into a little bit of this after, but it's funny enough when you think about all the big charities that raise a lot of money, a lot of them are actually still just trying to figure out their systems and sort of porting and where they have all this data stored and who they know and what information they know. Um, so it's, it's funny that you should say that because it's probably under 5% which is the actual number of organizations that have all the systems in place and know their donors well, or alumni, or volunteers, or in whatever capacity they work with. Um, so when it comes to the competitive advantage, you guys all were right. Um, all of those things are definitely a competitive advantage. And these days, I guess, as we all collect data and have been collecting data, because charities have been collecting data since the dawn of time and tax receding, um, there's just a lot of information and more information now. So it's a matter of what information is necessary, what is not, and how do you make the right decisions. So at EA, we believe the competitive advantage is sort of data-driven decisions. Because you don't want to just make a decision on a whim to say, because this is how we've done it in the past. So this year, we have to pour a lot of money into telemarketing or you know, annual programs or major gifts and do it this way because it's worked. That's not necessarily the way um, what we believe works best. We believe that data helps fill in those gaps and really helps you uh, clarify a better decision-making process. So everybody probably knows this. Um, treat different donors, prospects, yeah, I can't speak apparently, time change. Uh, treat different donor prospects differently based on what you know. And I think that's already kind of been mentioned a little bit because all of us in the room are very different. We all have different tastes. We all have different likes and dislikes. Um, but we also come together in the sense that we also 
uh, support similar charities. So different charities are supported by like a uh, different group of uh, individuals, but they're all unique, they're all different. So it's really about how do you find that information and how do you make the right decisions on who to ask, how much to ask, and what does that look like? And I guess in this world, people are expecting it, right? They expect that their information is being collected on Facebook and other places, and they expect you to know. And if you don't, uh-oh, not a good thing. And at the end of the day, this is what everybody wants, and this is what everybody expects. It's that, what I call the 360 view of knowing where your donors are, what brands they're connected to, or volunteers, um, or those that engage with your charities. Um, knowing where they live, what their values are, why they give to you. Um, knowing sort of their financial situation to a degree of how much they can give to you. And when I say that, it's more about don't ask me for $5 million if I only can give you a million. Because what are the chances that I'll give you that million? Probably not very likely if you've asked me for five. Um, and that I've been in those conversations and it's more of a matter of someone feeling embarrassed. If you're asking me more than I can ever give you at a specific level, the chances are I won't give you anything because I feel embarrassed now that you've asked me for so much and you may have asked my friends or other people that I'm associated with who have given you that much. So if I give less, I'm going to look out of place. Um, and at the same time, people will know that I can't give that much. So um, these are part of the expectations, like knowing lifestyles, knowing sort of loyalties and all those other things. So this is what most charities and organizations are trying to strive for, even banks and automotive companies. Um, and this is sort of what some of the donors expect us to know about them. So it's, it's kind of an interesting sort of intersection to be at. Anybody have any questions? See a few puzzled faces. Those arrows aren't necessarily connecting each subject, but like the, the volunteer is it necessarily connected to loyalty? Yes, it's that whole sphere. So these are all the different groups that one might be associated with or have programs. So it's your volunteers and then sort of the full circle. So their brands, association, and other things. So b before I get into sort of um, data and analytics and sort of the EA approach to things and how we've helped some organizations and some a case study that actually spreads across one client in a couple different areas, um, I thought I would just start with very briefly the whole question and the premise of big data and where do we get information? Um, is it legal and does it, uh, is it pro uh, conflicts with any of the Canadian privacy laws, et cetera? So from the EA perspective, um, all of our data gets mapped down to the six-digit postal code. We don't go any further than that. In the US, you can get down to the household. And this is just based on Canadian laws. You can't go any further than a six-digit postal code in Canada. Um, so if somebody's offering you that information to go past that, you should start questioning a little bit of where they're getting their data from and what does that look like. Um, but we only go down to the six-digit postal code. And for us, that's, we, we get data from a whole bunch of different providers and uh, uh, data sources, some partnerships, some open source like government and whatnot that provide data to everybody. So as one example, um, the LIN, which is a health uh, data set, um, organization in Ontario, provides information to all Ontario hospitals. It works at a specific level of geography. Um, so it has territories. So we take that information, we take a whole bunch of other information, and we level out the geography down to the six-digit postal code. And um, that's sort of how we apply the data. And taking one step back, I should probably start with, there's over 800,000 postal codes in Canada. Um, I didn't know that until a couple of years ago, to be honest. Um, and postal codes do get retired. They change because geographies and boundaries change in certain towns or cities and the landscape across Canada. Um, so when we're mapping all of this information, we do it to the postal code, and we're always doing it to everybody's current postal code while keeping information. Um, and it translates to a whole bunch of different databases. Um, there's about, I think, 15 million, just over 15 million. 
So if it's in a dense population like the city of Vancouver, you could be looking at between 14 to 16 households. If you start to spread further north uh, or in a less populated area, it could be a little bit bigger. So the geographies obviously change, the households change. It could be sometimes upwards of 100 postal codes in some areas. Um, if you look at apartment buildings, they will have multiple postal codes attached to them, and they could also span a larger sort of apartment or dwelling, the amount of apartments or dwellings as well. Um, which is why when we work, we work with um, a unique ID, uh, a city or town name, as well as a postal code. So the city or town name usually breaks up um, where the postal code is, because the postal code can kind of straddle two different towns. So it helps us sort of identify and uh, zero in on a particular postal code. So we only break it down to individual households. We don't do corporate uh, organizations um, because nobody lives in a corporate office or such an office like this, maybe possibly. Um, so we only do household, inf like a postal code that has residential. We don't do any corporate. Um, and everybody across Canada fills out a census, as an example. So there is information from like the census is one of the partners and information that we get from, it's free, it's public, um, and you identify yourselves as a homeowner or the main homeowner. So that is one of the sources of data that we have. So we would know that there's a male homeowner or head of household in X house. Here, some people identify as both. So you will have a female male, so we can kind of sort of aggregate across. But we don't, uh, we're not able to provide business information. So, any other questions? This is not even the exciting stuff. <laughs> um, so it all breaks down to these 40, 40, now it's 45 actually, we just updated it, uh, different data products. And I'm only kind of setting the stage of this because it kind of gets into some of the case study and the work that I'm going to show in the persona building. Um, funny enough, said me some, yeah, somebody today asked me about when you look at behaviors, cannabis number two on the list, it popped up. Um, so. Behaviors, there's a lot of surveys that we pull um, from optics like Vivid Data Numeris that talk about people's social media behavior, which I'll be talking about, um, people's media, traditional media consumptions, newspapers, all that. But now we also have survey information across the country that's been provided about cannabis use. Um, some people kind of smile when I first mention it or they kind of point it out and laugh as earlier today. Um, and when it comes to charities, a lot of charities look for sponsorship. So we'll, um, I don't believe it's in this uh, case study deck, but when you're looking for sponsorship, cannabis companies now have a lot of money. They can't market directly to people, so they're looking at different partnership opportunities or sponsorship. So a lot of charities in different conferences and different events are talking about what's your gift acceptance policy? Do you accept alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, etc.? So cannabis has now, in the fundraising side, has come up in the sense of you know, are you going to accept a sponsorship gift from a cannabis company? So what we're able to do, and I'll show as part of the persona, is sort of create a persona and a profile of an individual, and now we can layer on top of that their cannabis use. So if you're a cannabis company, you can actually see your return on investment from a charity based on people that consume or, and also give you that direct access to people who consume. So it's kind of another way to go about it. Um, other than that, uh, we have different sort of information on demographics, so the structures of family, how old are your kids, how many kids you have, languages that you speak, um, income levels, so Wealthscape's financial, we can get into income when it comes to disposable, discretionary, when it comes to your savings, RSPs, all of that information. Um, and then on the psychographics, which is actually my favorite data set, social values, it really talks about what are your values as a person or as a postal code in the sense. Sort of, do you support your local community? Do you care about giving back in a legacy format? Do you volunteer because you want it, you have time and energy and you want to make the world a better place? Um, so that kind of comes up in social values. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about that one in particular. Um, and then we have just some other ones like community life and giving back and home scan. So how do you give? What are the channels that you give at? So 
uh, previous conversations around telemarketing or uh, annual giving and direct mail. So we would know, based on some survey information that's done across the country, map down to the postal code, how people give and what channels are most comfortable. Because here, um, who here has been asked lately for a gift? Just these people? Wow. I should live in Vancouver. Um, I get mail all the time to my house, to different charities that I didn't even know existed. So be, people buy lists all the time. People call me all the time. Sir, do you have a minute to talk 10 minutes about um, uh, some water issue in pick a country? Or would you like to support a community center on the other side of town? Like I get calls all the time because I made it on someone's list or I gave a gift and they shared my name with somebody else. Um, so um, we're able to actually see who are the right people that you should be contacting who have a prevalence of your charity or your cause, whether volunteer or donor, and also how to reach them best. So based on media behavior, based on channel, so should you be calling them or should you be mailing them? Should you be um, engaging with them on social media? So those are the kind of things these are all used for. Question. I, I love questions. Just wondering, I don't get a lot of those calls. Yep. But I have a cell phone. I don't have a landline. Right. I'm wondering how that's impacted things. Like, can you still reach people by a landline? Is there a more cell phone? I guess that you're saying, like, social media as well. Yeah, it's a mixture. I was at a conference on Friday and I listened in on that exact topic. Most people are now converting to cell phones because they don't want a landline. I haven't had one in four years, thank God. Um, so people are able to find out a cell number. In some instances, you're able to find out where that person lives. Um, so you can do it based on that information and sort of fill in gaps through different data hygiene or enhancement processes. So people are still calling people. Um, and also in some charities, that's one of the things that they ask you for. Can you fill in your cell phone number or your, or your home line? And that's the information they use to contact you. And that becomes one of their sort of avenues to do it. So it's still used. It's just used a little differently. So telemarketing sometimes, depending on the practice, kind of changes. But social media and other things are becoming more prevalent. So, so very quickly, a um, lot of our work is really what you're going to about to see is really based on the premise of birds of a feather flock together. So when you're sort of aggregating data to the six digit postal code, you're not going to get 100% accuracy because you're doing it down to the postal code or 14, 16 households or however many. But you're getting about 85 to 90% because if you think about your neighborhoods and your house uh, and the people that live around you, you either want to live in an area or, a, or a, a, on a street that resembles you, that has similar values, that it is in a similar life stage, whether it's little kids, older kids, um, that believe in the environment, whatever it is, or you want to live in an area that you want to aspire to. So you might buy a bigger house that you can't afford. Um, you buy cars because your neighbors have similar cars. You don't want to be that one person left out. Similar to the comments about someone being asked for five million when they can only afford a million and they don't want to give you because they don't want to feel out of place with the rest of the community. Um, so that's really the premise of a lot of this stuff, but it's also how we aggregate everything down. So a lot of these clusters, so we have 68 clusters um, where we've taken the 800 postal codes across the country and we've layered on top the 20, 25,000 now uh, data points that make up each one of these clusters. So based on geography, based on income, based on social values, you're able to see where your donors or your volunteers or those affiliated with your charity are and then how do you talk to them in a mass way? Uh, talk to the masses in a singular way. And that's really the premise of a lot of what we're gonna talk about. And we do have a free app that you can download from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. Luigi did it here earlier. Uh, you can test out your postal code and it gives you sort of a sense of these different segments um, from brand consumptions, looking at what ice cream do they eat, what kind of cars do they drive, those kind of things. So it gives you a good sense of that. So, um, like I said, I'm gonna walk through two different case studies, one client, where I'll um, start from the beginning in terms of why they came to us and when they came to us, and some of the work we've kind of continued on with them um, that spans different areas. So it goes from an annual giving sort of program 
through to um, plan giving, because plan giving is a hot topic, as we've discussed, um, and sort of understanding how to be a little more proactive and what you could do. Um, and in between, there is going to be some talk about channel. Um, so when you're building your personas, and that really is what we try to do here, it's building that persona so you can talk to those donors, you can talk to those volunteers, and make them feel like you're talking directly at them versus everybody that you're trying to reach. Any questions? Okay. So Mackenzie Health, it's a Toronto suburb hospital. Um, they're one sort of campus at the moment. They're fundraising for another campus. So they came to us, the foundation came to us because for a number of years, um, their database kept on shrinking. So they took the one message, across, one message for everybody approach. So I don't remember the exact number that was in their database, but they kept on spamming everybody with one singular message. Come support us, we need the money for X, Y, and Z. Come support us, we need the message from X, Y, and Z. So they had people unsubscribe, they've had people call them and tell them stop calling me. Um, and their database was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so their attrition rates also came down because a lot of the donors weren't returning. They were just saying, same message, same message, no impact, no nothing. You're just asking me for more money all the time. You're never telling me exactly where it's going, the great stuff that's happening, and the things that interest me, you're not conveying to me at all. So what we did with them is we took sort of the, the PRISM approach where we took all of their donors, we put it through PRISM, and we saw what different segments pop up. Um, and they had one 19, 16, and two pop up. So a little bit of, and you can kind of see, mapped with some of our data that I spoke about, um, what the different groups kind of came up. So they had generous Asian families, philanthropic older families, altruistic young families, noble seniors, and kind middle-aged families. A nice big wasp of people. Kind of covers almost everybody. Yep, yep. Um, so some of this, you know, it didn't surprise them, and it shouldn't surprise them. Um, but they were sending the same message, same visuals, same everything to every single one of these groups. So if you're the generous agent families, and you see a direct mail piece or a piece with just Caucasian white families, that just says, please support our, the hospital, would you support the hospital? Raise a hands that say yes. Raise a hands that say no. Most likely not, because you're not really speaking to me in the community, you're speaking to the general public. Um, if you're the noble seniors and you're seeing the same family over and over and over, and, I don't, and you don't see yourself in those ads, and sort of what I'm trying to give to, do you think they were giving? Over time, less and less and less and less, because it was one big message. So by breaking it out this way, by uh, mapping our data on top of theirs, we were able to find some interesting information. Um, and that is one message does not fit all, that you have to look at different messaging across and see um, how do you reach them. So by putting social values on top of this, we were able to kind of map out what are the values of the hospital that match the values of these different groups. Um, what are some of those val imagery that they want to see? Through social values, you can start to see imagery. And by that, I mean that um, if family is important to them or they're more liberal, whatever their views are, you will a you're able to see it come out in social values. So then the imagery that you're kind of presenting them is based on their belief in what a family structure should be. Because everybody's belief of family structure, like in this room, would be different. Um, and then demographics, understanding how many kids you have. So if they don't have any kids in the house and you're asking them to support a NICU that, you know, has a lot of births, kind of doesn't make any sense because they don't have any kids or they might not be planning any kids. So understanding sort of the demographics of who you're trying to reach or the group of people you're trying to reach 
understanding the sort of their values and how to speak to them as a group is really important. Um, and that's what they kind of learn through this process. Any questions? Um, so the one I'm going to show you is just a regular, just a direct mail. Um, a lot of the ones here are just one-time sort of campaigns, but I'll also show the evolution on the last one of how year over year it actually changed. Um, so what we did is, really what this boils down to is persona building. So here, uh, who here on the fundraising side has sort of built out a mini little persona of who they're trying to reach? When they're writing to someone, do they have a sense of the target? One hand, maybe two. Do you have a sense of like what you want to convey, the language you're using, for the most part? Um, you have an idea in your head, you know, if it's say an older donor, Betty Blue Hair, maybe, what she may want to hear from you, um, how to talk to her in that sort of, you know, fashion as you would talk to maybe an older, more mature person. Don't want to single anybody out. Um, like what she would be expecting. So that's really what persona building is. It's building a persona of who you're trying to talk to in the language, in the tone, in the vehicle that they would want to hear. And that's essentially what we started to do with them with each one of these groups. We built out a little persona, and then we started to say, well, this is the persona of this group based on your data with our data on top. And this is also how many households there are on the ground. So we can, t based on how many donors you have, we can also then start to map out, here are all the other donors that look like this persona, they're on the ground that you're actually not reaching. And that'll be in the next couple slides. So the first one, the kind middle-aged families, in their case, um, there's 6% uh, um, of the households in Canada fit this sort of demographic. Um, population, 5%. Um, and you can see the households versus the actual populations themselves. So this is sort of a higher overview outside of their geography, um, but it kind of pinpoints, you can see how it kind of correlates. And then we could get down to their geography levels and boundaries as well. I just didn't show that slide. Um, it's more so a mark, sort of our, my team sort of putting these little groups together based on some assumptions. There's no correlation between kind only gives between a thousand to two or um, it's kind of when they saw these groups, they kind of just made an assumption they're kind. Sometimes our clients actually change the names to fit an internal perception or something that correlates that everybody then talks about. So some of our clients, um, and one of them actually did a presentation last year and I was a little surprised, they then take these names and kind of embed it so everybody in the organization that will be dealing with these sort of personas will be talking, have you reached out to the kind and whatever personas and this is how I did it. So every, all of their verbiage now goes around that. So we either create them or our clients then kind of change to fit what makes sense for them. Um, but this is really nothing more than somebody on my team kind of putting them together. Um, and the other thing that you can see here that the index, uh, over 200. So when something indexes at 100, that's zero or flat, that's the average or the average, um, well, it starts at 100. We look at anything between 80 to 100 is generally average. Anything indexing above 100, so 110, 120, and and more means it's, um, it's, there's a scale actually at the bottom, above average, um, and that means that profile is more likely to be in your donor file. So in this case, this profile was 236% on the index, um, or 200 times, or double the amount of times uh, more likely to be in your file um, versus how many are on the ground. Um, and this is a great chart that they use that also uh, that we ran through with them to talk about social values. So when I talk about social values, there are about 100 social values um, in our data set. So 
we usually talk about the top ones and the very bottom ones. And why do we do that? Because the top ones are the ones that you want to highlight and think about and incorporate in your language and sort of how you speak to them and how you think about them. But you want to do the same thing with the bottom ones because the bottom ones are the ones you want to stay away from because sometimes you could be actually doing both, not knowing it, and you're kind of trying to attract but also deterring donors or volunteers because you're actually talking about, and I'll just throw this one out, religiosity. And you're talking about how religious your organization is or a part of it was or there's a history and your donors are actually showing up as they really don't want to hear about that. That's what's going to turn them away. They want to give to an organization not because they're religiously affiliated to anything, but because they're an organization that's doing good in a particular area. So if you're actually doing both, you're actually not helping your cause. And that's why we talk about the top ones and we talk about the bottom ones. And here you talk about flexible families. So my, point, uh, my earlier point about people in this group believe in flexible families. Their definition of families are very different than traditional views of families. Um, their sort of equal relationship with youth. So if they have kids, the way they parent or the way they talk to kids is going to be a little bit different, um, which is, again, not very traditional. Um, Things that are interesting here, personal control and pursuit of novelty. So when you talk about personal control, this group likes to make their own decisions. So if you're going to make a decision for them on what they should be donating to, you're probably not going to attract them because they want to feel like they made that decision. You can give them some options. You can talk about what sort of uh, opportunities they are and why, why this case is the, like, the best thing to support. But they want to feel like they made that decision. Um, and pursuit of novelty, if you're having an event. These people want unique experiences. They don't want to go to the same gala with the same chicken, with the same lovely table settings and every, like all galas used to be. So they want to feel different and they're going to be attracted to those things. So these social values, as you guys can start to see, start to frame what the persona is going to be like. So you start to have a sense of who these people are. Um, and we do a little bit of a write-up, but we also talk about them, and there's a lot more that pop up, but these are the top ones. Um, another one I'll just very quickly mention, um, effort towards health, a hospital asking you. They're sort of higher indexing on effort towards health, and you're trying to improve health. I see a great correlation, but the other one is importance of brand. So if your brand is reputable, if your brand is trusted, that's who they kind of gravitate to. So the ones that don't have a trusted reputation, that are not known, they're not going to gravitate to those. So you, can, you guys, again, can start to see the way people's values and how those personas are starting to shape. And then at the bottom, you know, primacy of the family or traditional families, low index. So again, if you come back to that first comment I made, if you're sending everyone out one singular message with one singular image, and it happens to be just a regular family image, these guys are not going to be attracted to them. This group of people um, are not going to be attracted. So you're actually pushing them away. And that's what I meant by one message does not all, fit all. Any questions? So it's basically okay Cupid. Sorry? This is like okay Cupid, except. I. Okay Cupid. Okay Cupid. Yeah, like what? a dating app? Uh, I guess. <laughs> well, Dating app with your donor, yeah. so it, or your volunteers. Highly transparent. Yeah, this is definitely highly transparent. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, all fundraisers, like I said, all sort of organizations that try to get more volunteers, you're trying to talk to someone about what they may be interested in and correlate why your message is important or why your cause is important. Um, so. Just sending a message to all with one, one sort of big wasp of a message doesn't always work because our interests are different. So here, if you have an opportunity to have a sense of what this group of people might be interested in, like everybody in this room came out for this session, I'll, let you know, I'll ask at the end if it was worthwhile or not. Um, if you have a sense of what everybody in the room is like, as a speaker, it helps me. Right? So it's kind of that same information. As a fundraiser, if you know a group of people are more inclined to give to you 
because your cause does X, Y, and Z, and this is the way you should do it, your su success rates are going to be higher. So I guess it could be like that app in a way. Um, any other questions, thoughts, question? Jean? So this is our data. This is Enveronics data. So this was pulled from our sister company who does research across the country. So it's survey data that's layered on top that we've mapped down to the postal code. So we know social values of every postal code across the country. Yeah. So we get donor information. So uh, unique ID, city or town name, and a postal code. Then we map our data on top. And if they give us uh, giving history or engagement, there's no personalized information. Then once we layer this on top, we know that that person lives in a postal code that has those attributes. That's how it essentially works. Does that make sense? Yep, in a very small little community. Um, the next sort of thing that, one of the things that we did with them was look at social media. So I talked about uh, media channels and sort of how do you reach people. Again, using survey data and information, we have a sense of these types of people, this is how much time they're spending on different channels. Um, and this one's a little older, so some of these social media um, apps no longer exist, apologies. Um, but then this is how you sort of build that profile to say most of the people in this profile, uh, most of the people that fall within this target are sitting on, you know, Facebook uh, 81% or 81% of the file at aver average rates of 100 or 36% of the file at 33% above average rates sit on Twitter. So then they're able to take this along with other sort of media and other sort of uh, information, start to say, if these are the people that I'm trying to talk to, these are the best sort of modes or channels to use. Um, because what I say is, and I've done this before, uh, joining Enveronics, nothing in life is free, generally speaking. Um, and even when you have a volunteer spend their time doing this or somebody, somebody has to create the message. Somebody has to give them direction. Somebody's spending time, so it's costing someone salary or other to sort of activate some of this stuff. So even, the ch even though the channel's free, if you're spending time and you're spending it in the wrong place, it's kind of a waste of money. Lost opportunity, lost revenue. But this is sort of, yeah, sure. Yep. Maybe is there some sort of balance that you found where it's uh, in terms of like how efficiently you use the data you have? Like, uh, sort of this, this is more important than that, or focus on. Uh, I just have a hard time imagining someone really understanding and going through all of this information to build the, the final product. Um, you're right. My team does a lot of that. And we'll come back and say these are sort of the groups that are more likely to be like, so the indexing numbers, these are the groups that are most likely to give you at higher rates. And if, you're only have, if you've only penetrated five or 10 or 15% and there's still a lot to penetrate, you know, we'll make a recommendation focus in on this group first or first two groups depending on how much you can actually do and then sort of make your way through and also depending on program. Um, so this was very applicable to a specific program. So groups were chosen and time spent in a sp with a particular group because of the propensities that they give, also how much they've penetrated. Um, because a lot of times we get uh, conversations started and our clients say, well, you know, we've, we've already targeted every you know, middle-aged person that there is. And then when we actually show them their donor database versus how many households are on the ground that fit the same profile, we can tell them in actual numbers how many there are more of. So then we can tell them you still have 80% of households that are on the ground that fit the exact characteristics and profile. So we'll help sort of zero in on 
who to focus in at first and kind of progressively go from there. Yep. It's kind of how to focus a little bit better and who to focus on. Because when you start to, depending on the organization, if you're a national charity, provincial, or even a city like, or town charity, um, focused on a particular thing, um, your sort of penetration and also who you're targeting is going to be sized appropriately. So, and your teams would be bigger or smaller to activate. Yep. But you have all of this data and information on that group. Right. So how do you choose how to spend your time? So that's where we have the conversations about how much you've penetrated, what are the biggest groups, what are your best potential, and that's how you go back and forth, and then you make a decision on that. Because you can't talk, target everybody, because you don't have most organizations, I don't even think there is one, that has a big enough team to do that. So it's really zeroing in on who's giving you at the highest rates, and what is your highest return on investment and sort of starting from there and then working your way through. And most times the group sizing is not that big for the most part. And here's sort of a great example of that. So these are three, some, uh, three of the groups and sort of correlates with the colors. I don't know if you can see this one's blue, this one's pink and that one's orangey yellow. Um, and you can see where they're actually located on the ground. So first off, um, this client didn't know that these people exist on the ground where they are because they actually thought they cover a smaller geography. So one, they were surprised of where they are and how many people are there. So looking at sort of penetrations and exactly to that question, they then start to prioritize who would they reach and how many overlap with other campaigns that they're already doing that have similar sort of individuals. Um, but at least this started to, for the first time, show them where these people live. And this is a very small geography. This is just north of Toronto. Um, sorry, I didn't bring a Vancouver client. Um, I thought this was just easier. Um, but this, in a very small area, kind of showed them exactly where these people live. So whether they, based on the information, look at telemarketing, whether they looked at direct mail, they're able then to target these people based on their postal code. So Canada Post, send them off, look at the different neighborhoods uh, and target, and then spend to your budget. So part of it obviously is budget and resourcing. Any other questions? Nope. So here are some of the results. Um, response rate, 62% increase. Um, overall re uh, revenue per fundraising campaign, 45% above. Part of that also had to do with if you're spending less time on bigger mass sort of campaigns that are not going to have a good return because you're not hitting everybody, what I call spray and pray, because, you know, 100,000 people, let's mail everybody because you never know who might give to you, versus targeting just the people that will give to you, you're saving on costs while also targeting the right people, so 45%. Um, and in their case, also 33% increase on patient response. So when you go to a hospital, hospital typically is not allowed to share information or all of your information with the foundation to start asking you for money. They will, in some cases, they will ask depending on jurisdiction and whatnot. Um, all of them are different. Um, they will ask for just a patient name and when they were in the facility. They, they're not allowed to tell you for what or any of that. So you have a lot of foundations spraying and praying all patients asking them for, for money because they think and they're also praying that they had a good hospital visit because not every hospital visit turns out well. Uh, you benchmark these results of a targeted campaign against their, against their previous stuff. Yep. Yep. And those are the results. Uh, it does, it includes everything. So in many cases, we've actually shrunken mailing lists by more than half, um, and, that's, and then included in costs, and that's what the clients show. Because the spray and pray is not always the best, and probably cost you more in mailing and printing and all that fun stuff um, than our costs involved. Um, so the next one is sort of a continuation 
uh, they came back to us with another challenge, um, and that had to do with planned giving. Um, those in the room that are familiar with planned giving, there's always a five-year rolling average, because obviously you will never know who dies. Um, so it's, that's when you get the money, when somebody passes away. Um, so that's how charities, for the most part, have been dealing with planned giving, kind of just budgeting based on a five-year rolling average. So what we've started to do is look at, one, again, the social values and the messaging, and two, looking at lists and saying, well, this person has a lower discretionary income um, and has less money coming through the door, but they happen to be in Vancouver and sitting in a house that's worth now $2 million. And we know that they have a little bit of stocks and bonds, so you start to build out a portfolio. So instead of asking for money now and asking for 100 or 1,000 or $5,000, talk about the legacy that they're able to leave and they're still able, and educate them on that they're still able to leave a bigger gift, but just when they pass. So they can make the same impact a donor that's being flashed around the city of 100,000 can make because they're sitting on a house that's now worth 2 million bucks. So it was the same regular direct mail, okay. um, and it was print. So I'll start with this. So it was the same direct mail package, but all we started to do was zero in on who are the people that are most likely to give to you because their values match up with the hospital values, um, and who should you be targeting. So lists that typically were 20,000 pieces or 15,000 became 5,000 pieces. Um, the last one's even smaller than that. Um, so I'll first say that the clients by this point who had been at a couple of other places that started to do this was less hesitant than the people, the rest of the people in the, in the, um, in the organization because if you go tell a fundraiser who does annual programs, we're taking your 20,000 pieces, we're gonna shrink it down to 5,000 pieces the first thing they're gonna say is, are you crazy? How am I gonna reach all those people? There's 15,000 pieces that have a chance, 2%, 3%, whatever number you wanna throw out there, to give to me. So I might miss out on that golden nugget that now I'm not mailing. So there was more um, continuing to, uh, to steward those people and talk to them and talk about the process and trusting the process. Um, so you could see the before EA, when it comes to plan giving, was under 5% response rate. Did you do the same campaign? Or same. Segmentation, you try different we te try different approaches. So coming back to the tailored approach, okay. um, same campaign. So we're now we're trying different approaches. Correct. Um, yeah. Well, slightly different constituency, because now we've identified them. So they fell into one of those six buckets, um, whereas before it was the, let's mail everybody, so everybody in our database got a plan giving message, or everyone we assume that has an age or we had an idea got a plan giving message. Um, and they will keep on getting it until we see that gift come through the door. So which is very typical of a lot of organizations. So they were getting less than 5%. Um, the first one we did with them, 2015, uh, we got a little bit better response, so 31%. 5%, less than 5%, 31, it's pretty good. Average was above 19% of the regular average of a planned giving camp mail campaign. Uh, for them, yes, and they are an Ontario hospital. What's your um, planned giving average, 16,000 by year, or? So, what do you mean? Like the average gift, plan giving? Like so it all depends on organization. It depends on sort of list, depends on a whole bunch of different things. So when I get asked that question, it always really depends on the region, depends on the organization. Because someone giving to a hospital might give a higher gift average than someone giving to UNICEF or school or Habitat or the Red Cross. Um, different causes get different gifts. Um, so those things all change. But the actual average of a conversion rate for a male piece is always pretty much consistent throughout. So the response rate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay.
So these were all within their own file. So your best plan giving donors are the ones in your file. So either they've given for a period of time $10 a month, $5 a month, they've given every other year um, for consecutive years, whatever it is. Um, when it comes to plan giving itself, your best donors are within your file because they're connected to you in some way and legacy gifts are considered to be a, long, a longer term thing because um, most people um, put their will together for the first time. Anybody want to guess an age? That's a good guess. Anybody else? 65 is your first will. And you will change it two and a half times in the course of your, your life, two and a half times, which is a weird number. Um, so a lot of people start asking a lot earlier. So people might get asked for the first time at 40. So the amount of time you're now spending with that person asking them and, um, for a gift is quite a long time. And most people actually don't put their hand up to say, you're in my will. We reduced the list because we looked at prospects that can hit a specific demographic, but we also didn't look at age as just the qualifier. We had a bunch of different qualifiers. So it's not everybody who's 70, et cetera, et cetera. There's the social values, the connection to the hospital, the level of engagement. So do they come out to events? Do they give? Do they ever call you and ask a question? There's a bunch of stuff that we put together to build that persona. Any other questions? Um, so then in 2017, we did it again, sort of, uh, we did another sort of mailer, and that's actually the most recent one. We've done a couple times. Um, so in this mailer, we had 35 people raise their hand, say either you're going to be in my well or you are in my well. So within six weeks, they were able to get over $500,000 um, and sort of um, positive response rates of 11%. Um, and, and that's more high potential donors, just the response rate around that. Um, that one's neither here nor there. Um, and your conversion rate for this one was 40%. So we, we kept on zeroing in on sort of those perfect prime candidates that have a better likelihood or uh, a higher likelihood of becoming donors and raising their hands. So um, the more time we've spent with their file, the more times we look at their activity, the more time we can see sort of the responses to different things, we can start to evolve the process and slowly target a little bit better and sort of tailor the messaging. So you're not just sending one piece, you might be sending them your magazine or you might be sending out other communications. So sort of looking at all the other pieces that you're sending them, putting a plan together and sort of knowing when to ask versus when to just share information. So based on some of the social values, based on some of the other data, some of their behavioral characteristics, we started to help them plan a little bit better. And if memory serves me right, this one went out to maybe 1,200 people in total, and it was an A-B split test. So they took a bunch of their regular, like the, uh, a group, they did their regular thing with it, and then we took a group and we did our thing, and our group came back with the better response. And that comes back to, we started with a really big group of people. We narrowed it down in 2015, and then we had to tell them, trust us again, and we narrowed it down even further. Um, so we mailed a very small group of people, and within six weeks, and I only know this because they mailed on my mother's birthday, which is awesome, um, January, uh, February 13th, and within six weeks, they got that amount. And when they sent us this email, I was like, really? Is that even possible? But it was. So um, again, it kind of just reinforces the, um, kind of lead to my last slides, more about what we spoke about. Um, when you know the people that you're trying to reach, um, not necessarily who they are, but what are they like, your likelihood of asking the right questions or connecting with them are a lot better. Um, so, your responses are gonna sort of articulate that as well, right? Because if you're just gonna go on the street and talk and yell out data and analytics to a whole bunch of people, I can assure you, they're just gonna keep on walking. 
But if you come in here and talk data analytics with all of you who showed up particularly for data and analytics, the likelihood that you guys are going to be more responsive and actually listen to me talk, which my wife and kids do not, um, are probably a lot higher. So it's the same sort of concept. Um, talk to the people in the way they want to be talked to um, with things that you, that you have an idea that they're interested in. So don't ask them about technology when they have anxiety. Um, don't talk to them about the American election when they really are really patriotic and they could care less. Um, or that you know, the environment is really a hoax and all that they're talking about when they really care about the environment. So just talk about to people in things about things that they want to hear about. And that's really the whole idea behind this is each one of you in all your organizations have a lot of information, a lot of data. There's some other data, whether it's us or a bunch of other vendors and suppliers that sort of help you fill in some gaps. But the idea and the premise here is sort of to give you a better picture of who you're trying to reach and who you're trying to talk to in the best possible way. So that's really the idea behind this. It's building those personas, which everybody's been trying to do in different capacities in different ways in different programs, just making them a little more clear um, and giving you better success rates. So um, here's some of the other takeaways. Um, so at the end of the day, they're now going into a big campaign because they have to fundraise for that big building. Um, and they're just able to sort of then use those groups and keep on sort of enhancing and sort of know which program will hit what person. So um, that's really at the end of the way, at the end of the day, um, a big takeaway. It's more tailored communication and asked to its constituents in the right way. So questions, thoughts, question? Um, Sorry, Luigi, you're next. Yep. Well, big data is a big uh, conversa uh, piece of conversation. I mean, there's that stats can sort of discussion that's happening now. They're asking people, 500,000 people for banking information. Um, they're not really saying why for the most part. Um, so there's always sort of kind of questions and thoughts about it. like. How can you have my information? Here, you're kind of making assumptions for the most part. You're 85% directional information. So there's no personal information in any sense. It's just taking a better stab at understanding who, what people want or what might interest people. Um, and I bring it back to the Netflix. How many people in this room have Netflix? Just a few. So how many people in this room like when it recommends the next thing to watch? Probably the same people. How many people like the sort of ease and sort of comfort of turning on Netflix and it just sort of sorting all the things that you might be interested in based on what you watched? So you don't have to go through the entire library. How many other products do you guys like that has the same sort of idea? So really at the end of the day, this is what this, all this stuff is. It's kind of sorting out people that may have an interest or a like to what you do and you have a better uh, chance at them. There's no real private information that's shared because we never ask our, don uh, our clients for their donor information. Um, so it's really helping you aggregate and sort of look at people that have the highest likelihood without sort of any private information shared. Um, so does that answer that question? Yeah, I guess it's more whether... The response rate to it. We do get the call from time to time from a charity saying, I have a bunch of donors that ask me, how did you know that I was interested in this? So it's more about sort of looking at, you know, we're collecting information and we have some of your information sitting in our database. It's about responding to, we thought we would ask you if this is something you'd be interested in and taking a guess at it. And that's been a lot of the responses back. Um, people are always gonna ask questions. How did you know that I liked Apple Watches? Or how did you know I like these kind of cars? We're all sort of all this kind of stuff. It's just kind of that response and sort of, you know, we took a chance. You might be interested in this and this is why we, we sent it to you without saying you did it because you're Alan and you have two kids, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? 
Yep. These ones? Yeah. Um, so all of this, these are all partners. Some of it's public. Um, anyone, you know, anyone here can go access the census data. It's all available. You, it's all open source domain. Um, Equifax and some others, obviously not. Um, so we partner with some of these, so Aquifax is a partner. All of that is scrubbed. CRA information is open source. So it's a mixture of open source, a mixture of survey data, and a mix of scrubbed data. So we make sure that any data source that we get, any information that we get, is one scrubbed. And based on the level of geography, when we bring it down, it's never going to equate to me, you, or anybody else. Um, and usually the level of geography is higher. So, um, Equifax doesn't give us household information. They will give us like um, provincial. I think that's how it breaks down. So then we're taking that with everything else and aggregating it down to our data scientists are aggregating it down to the postal code. And that's for people to explain in a lot more detail that are much smarter than I. Um, so Enveronix Research is a sister company. I think they're up there as well. Um, they do surveys across the country on different things. So people's perceptions, so that's where social value comes in. They do a lot of political polling. They do a ton of different questions. Um, so they are one of our sources. So again, we take that information depending on the pocket of where it was asked. So when people fill it out online, they will identify they're in BC or they'll identify. So it's a lot higher level of geography. And again, we map it down to the postal code. Um, so no information that we get is at the postal code level. We're usually always mapping it down. Um, but most of the stuff is all open source, and some of, you know, some other vendors have the same access. Some other people do it. So even hospitals. Um, that example I, I mentioned about the Lynn, it's sort of in Ontario. Uh, it's regional. It's not even provincial or city, or it's at a regional level, and any hospital is able to access that, and they do, to know sort of patient flows and sort of community breakouts. So how many people potentially in this community have visited your hospital for diabetes or other things? Um, and we have a, um, the health data set, community health survey, is sort of aggregated down to the postal code. So in some cases, hospitals who don't have the infrastructure or want to get around it will license this um, to kind of get a better sense of their community and how do they right size programs. So should you have a cancer program or others, that's part of it. Yep. Yep. Um, it really depends on geography, depends on your donor, like your database, volunteer or donor. Depends on what you're trying to do. Um, it all differs. So when I get asked this question, I typically say it's better to have a conversation because we try to right size it to your situation versus just a general pricing structure of it costs fifty thousand for a database, whereas you might not need that. Um, and sometimes a lot of the work that we do is project based. So we have clients that license this. So you have banks, you have automotive. Like we play in every sector. Uh, the CPG companies, they will license this stuff because they have the infrastructure and the manpower to kind of implement. But there are a lot of charities that absolutely don't. So we work with charities that fundraise less than $500,000. I met with one this morning um, where we do a lot of the work for them. And we start small. We start with a small project that they can afford for a couple of thousand dollars. And we kind of work our way. And the idea is every w little win kind of builds up on the next win. And you start to get to know your donors a little bit better. But you're also able to show results. So um, it really depends on what you're trying to do. And everybody's trying to do something different. Any other questions? A lot of silence. Uh, Chris? So if, say, you, 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 you don't make the value in you know, such and such, they actually can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some smaller steps you can take to get other people to do it? Yep, that's, that's a great question. What things can you guys do? 
Right. Um, so I would say is, and I mentioned this at the last conference, that um, we all in some sort, in some of our programs already are doing some of this stuff. So if you think about direct mail, if you think about annual giving, we're sort of starting to profile those people that can give us smaller gifts, starting to get a sense of what they're responding to. Um, and I think the same sort of ideas can apply to everything else. So if you're looking at social media, because a lot of people are using social media as sort of an awareness channel or a fundraising channel, just test what people are responding to. What kind of messages are they responding to? So I, in my previous life, I had my team just look at, are people more responsive on Twitter? Or are they more responsive on Facebook? When we put something out there, what are the responses? Um, if we're sending out an e-blast to people, what are they starting to click through? What are they actually replying to? Um, and sort of constantly monitor and look at that. And that's sort of starting to build that sort of analytical sort of view that you're constantly looking and sort of testing different things. So, you know, Elijah was sending out different things on LinkedIn versus Twitter and other things about this talk. So just, that's a great example of what worked on Twitter, what worked on LinkedIn, who responded on one versus the other. So like little things like that, and what kind of messaging are they responding to? Is it about that image that he sent out last that was sent out yesterday from one of the slides, or was it that someone from Toronto was coming? Because there was different, so I'm just using that, apologies. Um, but that's the sort of analytical sort of approach you can start to use in your charity to say, what are people responding to? Are people responding to X direct mail or B direct mail? Are they responding to X message or B message? When they come to our website, what pages are they more likely to gravitate to? Are they looking at volunteer opportunities or are they looking at donor opportunities? Um, when we get calls, do they call us about our cost of fundraising or are they calling us about the great work that we're doing? So starting to look at that and starting to be more diligent um, around those things is probably a great first step that you can start to take in a very small way to get your teams and your colleagues sort of thinking about it in that analytical way that the next time you have to ask for a particular thing, you would have a better sense of the Twitter followers that we have are more responsive to this sort of request or a peer-to-peer -peer or Giving Tuesday. So whatever it is, if that makes sense. Any other question? So it really comes back to these personas. It's, it's really talking to people. So in this case, like who they are, because everybody responds differently. I know if I'm looking at me as an example, I get a lot of things by mail, but I'll only give online. But the direct mail is what sort of will remind me about a cause and a particular thing that I might be interested in, but I'll always go online. So it really depends. Other people might act differently. Other people might be more responsive to direct mail. Other people might be more responsive to social media. Um, so it really depends on your file and who you have. And kind of, again, you can follow them and see what they're responding to. Like if you do a, a Giving Tuesday campaign, so one year over another, sort of how did they respond last year? Did they respond to this message or that message or what they were giving to? So. Does that clarify? Yeah, so do you find that there's more time getting into specific people? Again, it's probably a bad answer, but it really depends on who's in your file, because your file might be different than Chris's file or Luigi's file, um, because a Habitat donor might look different than a Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation donor that might look different than a hospital donor, um, because people are interested in different things, so their responses are also different. Um, from Yeah. 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 That's exactly it. So it kind of varies, and I think the trends is more that you should be watching what your trends are based on your donors or your volunteers, and kind of look at what worked last year, what didn't work, what kind of messaging did we do last year? Can we test the same versus a slightly different one? And I would kind of look at it from that perspective. 
um, than what the general average is because there are organizations that are going to skew it one way. Like, how many people are aware of, I'll throw it at Toronto Hospital, sick kids? Have people seen their campaign? It's a little bit different than some of the other, other hospital campaigns. So it'll skew sort of awareness and how they're perceived versus some others. Or BC Children's is going to skew, um, you know, what Vancouver Art Gallery does because they both fundraise. Different sort of areas, different causes, different amounts. So, any other questions? With your illustrative uh, plan giving campaign. Yes. Um, It was a little bit different. It was based on the social values. Okay. Um, so Did you put any there, like, you know, we'll do it for you? Or? Nope. Um, one of the insights, it was interesting in their file in general, and I found this very, very uh, peculiar. Half of their file was really into technology, and half of them were afraid of technology. Um, literally about like 51, 49 maybe, like that close. Um, and you're talking about a hospital that's building a technology-friendly hospital to the point where they give you a little band when you walk in the door and monitors your heart rate. If, something, if you go into cardiac arrest, they don't do the code blue or code black or whatever. It's based on your band, and it calls the right doctor on their beeper. Like That's how forward-thinking this hospital is uh, about to, uh, that's about to open. So you can imagine if 50% of your community has anxiety and 50% love it, how are you going to talk to them? So it's kind of segmenting it and saying, okay, for the people that have anxiety, maybe we tune down the technology factor and talk about outcomes. Whereas the other one, and this is what we essentially did, was tune up technology and a little bit less on outcomes um, because that will speak to those two people. So that's how you do a a split. You find the social value in the triggers, and then you turn one up and turn one down. And that's how we kind of looked at it. Um, and we, it reinforced to the hospital side that, that was happening because their CEO was out in the community talking, doing his usual tour, talking about the, the hospital and how great it's going to be for the community. Um, my time? Oh, okay. Um, and the first time he spoke, a whole bunch of people came out, and he did a, sh a sh like road show and all that, and then he got peppered with 45 minutes of questions. Well, what happens if the power goes out? What happens if the technology is wrong and it diagnoses me X or puts me in the wrong part of the hospital? What happens, and he had questions after questions after questions, and he wasn't prepared. So the hospital started to use the social values, and this is sort of what the foundation was doing about raising money, and started preparing his speeches based on the group of people that have signed up to come out. So he knew the different, he would target people and communities, and he would know who he's talking to and tailor his messaging to them. No different than direct mail. So he knew if he was coming out to a particular group, this group is really anxious around technology. Maybe you should talk about, look at all the great outcomes we're having from the, um, from the birthing units, to the cancer programs, to the diabetes programs, emergency is doing really well because we're saving more lives because the technology is helping us do it and it'll continue to do it, but focus really on the outcomes. Whereas the other group was all about Apple iPhones and technology and it's the way of the future. So he would talk about the great MRI machines and the bracelets and all the other cool stuff that's gonna be happening and yeah, we're gonna save a few more lives because of that. So he was able to sort of tailor his messaging no differently than the foundation was doing it. So that's really sort of how you focus in on one sort of um, value or thing instinctively that's different between the groups that you can kind of pipe down, uh, turn down the volume or turn it up. That's a great question. Um, that is something I'm not very familiar with. Like, we just work on the post of code. Um, I'm sure there are other data providers out there that can do more sort of broad sort of strokes um, with email. Emails, 
a harder one for us to get into and something we've sort of somewhat stayed away from because one, people have multiple email addresses. Two, it's hard to pinpoint an email to a household or a postal code or, an, or a region because you could have got an email when you were at SFU and you back, moved back home in Halifax, but you still have that email that's somewhat active with all your friends and others. So it's kind of not viable to be talking to you in Halifax when sort of all our information is that way. So email is one of those territories we don't really play in as much, uh, just from that fact. Yeah, and here it's starting to stop as well um, because what they do is you kind of fill out a profile where they find a profile and try to match it to up everybody else in Facebook, which is almost everybody in the world. Um, but that's sort of not really privacy compliant anymore. So but people are staying away. Yeah, work at that, which is I think sometimes it's a two-step process. So yeah, not exactly. I used to work at a nonprofit where I had mostly just email addresses, which was not very helpful. So for me, we created a couple of different campaigns. One was like, oh, we're gonna send you a sticker. Like, give us your address and we'll mail you that sticker. Mm -hmm. um, some of it was like, oh, you wanna download this great PDF full of like recipes? Well, then I'm gonna need a couple pieces of information. So I started creating like small, cheap for me to deliver incentives to create sort of a value proposition for yep. people to share that additional information. Yeah, or you can have like a, I that's a good point. We've had, uh, I've seen some others do like draws, like come and win a free iPad if you give us your information and you register. We've all done those. Um, so that's how they sort of collect some information. Um, not everybody collects a postal code, but we do everything on a postal code level. So if you don't have that, it's harder to do. Yeah, because again, the premise of birds of a feather flock together in neighborhoods. Um, again, uh, if you want to test out PRISM 5, there's an app. Um, it really kind of shows, it's the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more information that's involved. But if you download the app, it's free. Um, you can, and you put in a postal code, you'll kind of get a sense of the different buckets that you can kind of look at and what it gives you. So it talks about how do you talk to people, some of their social values, kind of aggregates everything across Canada, and gives you some samples of where you can find these types of people. Again, it's just sort of... Uh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> we are number 20, uh, 34. Okay. So I'm a 16 in that. Um, yeah. So you can kind of just test it. And it gives you an aggregate of everyone in this, in this profile across Canada has an average income of X. They rent or own their house. They're white collar, blue collar, whatever. Um, their diversity is they're very diverse or not diverse communities. Gives you sort of a snapshot. Um, and then it gets into other buckets in terms of the way they think, where they are, and sort of some of their consumptions. So. And that gives all updates like every year, right? Like yes, yeah, so we update all of our data sets every year. Um, when the census comes in, we then do a full, like a bigger update. Um, all of our data for the first time. <laughs> there we go, there's another one. <laughs> Ding. Uh, it is limited, because yeah. again, it's a sample snapshot. Right. Um, we don't want people just sitting there all day long doing it. Well, what it's I also think, I, I just want to make the point, I mean, we're not typical Canadian nice Right. But you also see that, like, you know, there's maybe people who live outside of, like, the downtown core. Right. They just really want to go to Meredith yeah. or to the city. So, again, like, It gets updated on a yearly cycle, so it might be depending on, the, on that. Um, and the census data is now in all of our data sets. So, 2016. Um, because of the way they launched it and quickly sent it out, we were able to sort of include it in our, in our data sets. Um, but in some cases, we're actually sort of uh, looking forward. So they're sometimes um, looking five or 10 years ahead to look at what that community will look like. Um, so you're trying to do that at the same time. 